My name is Parker Van Valkenburg. I'm an assistant professor of anthropology here at Brown, and it is my pleasure to moderate today's second session, uh, which is entitled Collapse Pasts, Present Urgencies, and Archaeological Horizons. Uh, in this session, there'll be four papers uh, that encompass an extraordinary diversity of different topics, uh, but uh, bring to light um, and put in practice some of the thoughts uh, expressed by the panelists in the first session this morning and that will also be reflected on by panelists in a later portion this afternoon. Um, Francois Richard is associate professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, he is a historical archaeologist and anthropologist uh, whose work is centered on West Africa, specifically the Seine province of Senegal, but whose horizons extend across the Atlantic world. In his own words, his research investigates the political changes that have taken place in the scene over the last 500 years how those were manifested in social landscapes, and how they shaped the life worlds of peasant communities. This research is the subject of his monograph, uh, which I believe is soon to be available from the University of Chicago Press, so put your orders in now, uh, entitled Reluctant Landscapes, Historical Anthropologies of Political Experience in Scene, Senegal, 1600 to 1940, as well as two edited volumes that are hot off the presses, Materializing Colonial Encounters, Archaeologies of African Experience, Springer 2015, and Ethnic Ambiguity in the African Past, materi Materiality History, and the Shaping of Cultural Identities, uh, edited with Ke Evan McDonald, published by the UCL Institute of Archaeology. His talk is entitled, African Futures Past, Material Horizons of Peasant Expectations in Senegal. Please welcome Francois Richard. Thank you so much for the, uh, the kind introduction. Can everybody hear me? That's good. I wanted to thank Matt for uh, inviting me to the uh, to the conference as well as to to the organizers and having uh, made uh, the experience extremely smooth and pleasant. So it's been really wonderful. Uh, by way of starting the talk, I, sh I should say that uh, so Ma when when Matt contacted me, uh, I had a very similar "what the fuck man" moment, uh, <laughs> not being entirely sure how I should approach these various things, and so I, I dug. Um, um, and, and ended up basically doing what I normally do. Somebody who sort of crosses over between sociocultural anthropology and archaeology, my uh, project has been to essentially uh, examine ways in which both can actually be placed in conversation and think about ways in which, to some extent, archaeological methodologies, optics, perspectives can actually be used uh, in the service of broader anthropological uh, forms of questioning. And this is something which, I'm, uh, which I'll be trying to do today. Um, over the past decade, anthropological research in Africa has been aglow with the question of the future. Much of this work has tackled the neoliberal decomposition of life as usual and the challenge of crafting futures where once lively hopes and dreams have all but dried up. These, con these concerns have been part of a growing interest in uh, emergent forms of life and the recognition that emergent presence cannot be understood outside of the imagined futures driving people's actions. These questions seem all the more pressing in the climate of economic precariousness and political disenchantment, where the old utopias of limitless growth, an affluent society, and maybe even revolution uh, now look little more than pipe dreams. Finally, the future as an ethnographic object, or with the future as an ethnographic object, some are starting to examine the terms framing its conceptualization. Peter Pals has recently written that our approaches to the future have been guided by an addiction to what he calls futurism. In accepting the progressive time of development, nation making or modernity as fait accompli, we have overlooked the many ways in which people apprehend a changing present and act on the future. Similarly, uh, Janet Reutemann points out that our current obsession with the future is influenced by a global mood of crisis, something which uh, Dimitris has actually touched upon, uh, and that we have not been critical enough uh, of how the latter has shaped analysis. Uh, she remarks that crisis is not a self-evident reference to objective events, ruptures, or conditions. Rather, she calls it a blind spot for the formation of knowledge, a metaphysical gesture, a judgment that defines what counts as history and places moral demands on presence and future. Crisis posits a model of history gone awry, a derailment from the normal course of things. As such, it configures both problems and their solutions in rather narrow ways, making certain future worlds possible and others unthinkable. Reading these conversations, which often evoke the commingling of materialities and temporalities, uh, which of course are the, um, uh, the various kinds of things that archaeology trains in, uh, it is striking that none, absolutely none, uh, references anthroarchaeological literature. Hence the questions guiding this presentation. Uh, if anthropology is concerned with an emergent present, and if the future is pivotal to its comprehension, 
and if we accept, as I do, that archaeology is a thingly kind of anthropology, then where does archaeology stand in relation to the problem of the future? How does it plug itself into these conversations? Can it say something useful, meaningful, different? These are big questions with no single answer. My own take is rooted in West Africa and draws on motifs that have oriented historical research there. Uh, I find inspirations in four sets of considerations. First, the need for a critique of analytical categories. Secondly, how this can help to reframe the terms in which African histories are told. Thirdly, how the consideration of temporal multiplicities, including futures, promotes alternative formulations of African pasts and presents. And fourthly, what such projects tend to gain from archaeological materialities, and particularly archaeological materialities of futures past. First point. I'm compelled by Reutemann's critique of what concepts do and how they might shape what we say. Narratives of crisis illuminate aspects of our present, but they also obfuscate understanding in other ways, blinding us to historical processes that don't conform to a story of breaks and failures, but nevertheless give form to the world as we live it. Reutemann echoes here the concerns of other scholars of African history mostly, who are wary of the tendency to make African history fit known historical scripts and thus to legitimize the present as inevitable. For instance, as when African decolonization is interpreted through the futurist filter of failed nationalism and freedom, which actively silenced the alternative political imaginations crafted at the time and the complex reasons why they did not come true. These arguments have deeper implication for historical understandings of Africa. That's my second point. While crisis narratives single out neoliberal times, they have long been devices for plotting Africa's past in relationship to modernity. From the Atlantic slave trade to its abolition, from colonialism to the post-colony, Africa has often been described as a continent in crisis, a land of devastation, instability, and failure. Its past sacrificed, its present convulsed, its future truncated. As Reutemann notes, however, these sorts of history, uh, these, sorry, these sorts of stories structure interpretation in binary ways. Analysts have portrayed Africans as victims of capitalism and imperialism, or conversely, as artful cultural bricolaires, creatively responding to the turbulence and loss of global forces. Though neither view is necessarily wrong, the rub is that both accept uncertainty as a historical condition. Whether passive or reactive, Africans are enlisted into history by the shock of outside forces. Their worlds are always determined elsewhere. What's missing, of course, is a nuanced sense of African historicity. Ways of producing worlds and lives that complicate the assumption of rupture, crisis, and precariousness, what Reutemann labels the, the otherwise of Africa. One way into this historical otherwise, and that's my third point, is to recognize that African lifeways, then and now, have been fashioned by multiple temporalities. Tempos of the long and short term, slow and quick durations, homespun rhythms and distant events, cycles and interruptions have impressed the course of African histories. Our task then is to clarify the articulation. A serious account of temporality in Africa should not just engage with how the past surges in the present, but also espels argues with the multiplicity of futures which are acting on the present. People's actions are informed by traditions of social practice and cultural orientations to the future. Expectations, aspirations, hope, and anticipations are powerful forces in the past and present, <coughs> as Apadurai has recently argued. My fourth point. Uh, observers have long uh, highlighted the relationship between time and matter, and it's something which we covered yesterday with Laurent's presentation. Uh, to some extent, it's something which Africanists have long been aware of, as, as well as a long range of philosophers, as I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, some of which are, of course, uh, based uh, in, into the very sort of uh, material dimensions of African history. So, for instance, on the on the right, uh, you have I'm sorry, on the left, you have a, a sort of classic African fetish, which are fascinating objects per se, uh, which are literally um, um, uh, creators of or create an inter in intercultural time. A lot of people have sort of looked at these early fetishes as essentially forms of social contract that compelled particular kinds of obligations in the future, particular forms of partnerships, uh, particular kinds uh, of relationships between uh, traders, European and African traders. Uh, so again, there is a particular sort of materialization of time uh, in things like fetish. Likewise, in other media, for instance, uh, Chris Marker's wonderful list that you may see, the statues dies uh, uh, as well, uh, or even uh, which is basically a wonderful sort of exploration of uh, essentially the materialization, as it were, of colonial sets of relations uh, uh, in the form of um, 
uh, art history uh, in its various sort of registers. Uh, so to go back to some of the things that Matthew mentioned this morning, as well as, again, some of the things that Laurent uh, uh, talked about yesterday, Kozelik's uh, notion of the contemporaneity of the non-contemporaneous uh, evokes images of history as a space comprised of disparate layers of time. Benjamin and Bakhtin understood that time achieves concrete form as the traces of different epochs pool, mix, and coexist in a landscape. To some extent, it's something which Marxist analysis has also long recognized. Marx, of course, uh, has talked about these kinds of sedimentation. Uh, it's, they've been taken up in a spatial way in Henri Lefebvre. So again, these things are not necessarily very new. Uh, because of its privileged access to the material world over long time scales, archaeology is in the prime position to study the mixtures of different histories at different points in time and how they acted and continue to act on human experience. Recent research has underscored archaeology's unique ability to produce critiques of the present by tracking the repressed material histories shaping modern conditions. And we've had excellent examples of that which have been covered today and literally all the presentations have touched upon these kinds of questions most recently by um, by Krista. By demystifying the inevitability of certain narratives, archaeology can also spark commentaries about the future. Returning to Africa, we can say that our archaeological materials from form an alternative archive of present and future on the continent. Tapping multiple temporal registers at once, archaeological assemblages can help to qualify how Africa's history has been rendered. They can also conjure twisted, multi-stranded stories of its engagement with capitalism and colonialism that restore a sense of history's unpredictability, multiplicity, and incompleteness. Africa's otherwise lies partly in archaeological situation. And here I want to go back to very briefly to some of the things that Hugo was saying this, this morning. I think there is something to be said about the sort of the promise of a certain level of humility, both in our interpretations and in recognizing the fact that histories sometimes are bound never to be particularly histories of uh, uh, torment, uh, shock, turbulence. These histories are bound never to be reconstructed in full. And part of the way in which we might actually narrate that is by recognizing this incompleteness. So I, 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 I very much appreciated the point you were making. Accounting for African historicity outside of the categories of universal time requires a sense of how past people dynamically apprehended their future. Past futures, of course, are not always accessible in any straightforward ways, but the archaeological record is full of clues about them. While it is hard to excavate imaginations of the not yet or the different range of concerns, immediate, medium term, and long term, that past people were working towards, we can glance obliquely at the expectations that once organized collective life and its archaeological traces. And here, here I think there is a range of uh, African-based archaeological literature that has uh, given interesting pointers for how we might want to sort of apprehend that, and I'll just talk about them very briefly. Uh, in her recent study of encounters between living and dead in colonial Madagascar, Zoe Crossland has used Kozelik to frame colonial encounters on the island as an encounter between what she calls spaces following Kozelik, uh, spaces of experience that brought history to bear on the present and horizons of expectations in which the future was made present through hope and fear, wishes and desire, cares and rational analysis, receptive display and curiosity. Material landscapes here provide a tangible record of how colonial influences combined with experience to reassemble what the Piedrites called the cultural map of aspirations. In their book on the, on the archaeology of anxiety, Jeff Fleischer and Neil Norman dare us to study the emotional commitments binding communities of feeling and practice in the past. Effective dispositions of hope, fear, worry, and anticipation are inclined to the future, framing how past people cope with uncertainty and risk, and achieving material outcomes in ritual context, storage practices, or even subsistence strategies. Speaking of the latter point, and finally, Amanda Logan has used long-term botanical and environmental data to, to revisit assumptions of African famine, hunger, and poverty in Ghana's past. She shows how the people of Banda used a mix of crop diversity, craft production, and trade to manage risk and actually grow quite prosperous in times of climate Climactic, climactic or climatic instability. For centuries, they warded off the slow violence of environmental decay until colonial policy radically narrowed their portfolio of economic options. Here again, behind changing archaeological patterns, we can glance at the collective management of futures with clear lessons from the past for food security today and tomorrow. These examples highlight how archaeologists might go about recovering evidence of what I call a bit subversively, African futures past. 
Kozelik's notion of future past is fertile in that it urges us to consider how different times, some realized, others not, commingle in the present and create conditions of possibility for the construction of future worlds. Kozelik's visions, however, has no place for Africa, as he locates the capacity to make history, which he calls modernity, squarely in Europe. The notion that African past future is to, uh, uh, takes issue with this uh, and participates in the otherwise evoked above. It is a recognition that Africans, like everyone else, made and make history, but not as they please. The trick resting precisely on determining the changing balance between possibility and constraint. A recognition that Africans join others in the making of modernity. A recognition that the future is a cultural force that has long <coughs> mediated between Africa and the rest of the world a recognition of archaeology's role in retrieving patterns of African historicity, especially when people did not record their history in writing. Let me now turn briefly to the scene where I work, small province in western Senegal, uh, and just offer a, a little bit of archaeological evidence of how uh, regional peasants have anticipated and negotiated the future over the past 300 years or so, uh, turbulent time of warfare, enslavement, state predation, economic reconfiguration, and capped by colonial rule and, and, and uh, subsequently uh, the advent of, of independence. Uh, I'm not aiming at all for an exhaustive treatment, but we'll review a short selection of examples that address certain, that address certain assumptions <coughs> about peasant histories. I'm especially concerned about scenarios of systemic instability during the era of the slave trade, and conversely, scenarios of peasant refusal to embrace change under colonialism. As we'll see, archaeological landscapes of, for, offer considerable nuance to these portrayals when they don't completely refute them. I don't have a ton of time to discuss um, data, because a lot of the, the talks today have been fairly theoretical. Uh, so this is just a brief snapshot of the, what I'll be speaking from. Uh, I do want to say, however, that uh, I do tend to consider archaeology maybe a little bit more widely or broadly than uh, most people. I consider certain forms of history or certain forms of, of ethnography as being archaeological when they're engaged with sort of questions of materiality. So in some sense, I've taken up um, Laurent's call to sort of think about archaeology as a form of material memory, which can be tapped or accessed through different kinds of media. The scene is a rural, impoverished province at the margin of state pr prosperity. Uh, it is a historical home of the Surer, one of Senegal's largest ethnic minorities. The Surer have been represented as typical African peasants, which means that at best they have been celebrated as frugal, risk-adverse farmers seeking self-subsistence and autonomy. Uh, a more frequent reflex, however, has been to view Surer communities as backward and conservative, molded by culture rather than history. Uh, translated historically, uh, uh, the Sierra have been portrayed as two things, uh, powerless victims of the Atlantic economy and its climate of violence, or timeless prisoners of tradition during the colonial era. Uh, and I should note here that these kinds of narratives actually have been made by extremely well-meaning scholars who have, uh, on the one hand, decried the adverse effects of capitalism on African histories, or on the other hand, celebrated the richness and resilience of Sierra culture. So again, these kinds of narratives, and the meta-narratives, can actually affect uh, the sorts of stories told by people, regardless of political sensibility. Uh, or political inclination. A common assumption of historiography in Senegal is that commercial slavery turned the countryside into an apocalyptic hellscape. Peasant communities were the targets of raids and depredations. They were uprooted and displaced. Rural homes were abandoned. Their archaeological records suggest, however, a very different uh, picture. To be sure, uh, we note arrangements of the belt environment during the peak of the slave trade. Um, Rearrangements. When villagers had once settled in large, century-old, uh, concentrated settlements, as you can see here for the sort of 300-year period that precedes the advent of the trade, uh, in the 18th century, sites became smaller, widely scattered across the landscape, and occupied for a few generations. The most notable transformation, however, and in direct violation to common wisdom, uh, is the, not depopulation, but an explosion in human settlements uh, during the peak of the slave trade, uh, which vast, vastly exceed in numbers those of any previous periods. These patterns suggest that aspect of the Surer hinterland, a constellated village landscape, which observers have thought to be age-old, are actually quite recent, uh, and that other, quote, traditional elements of Surer culture or cultural ecology, like field organization, land holding practices, and environmental curation might actually also be creatures of Atlantic modernity. Material patterns offer additional light on practices of state making. On the one hand, archaeological landscapes of the 1700s and 1800s conjure a highly dynamic habitat. Site move, sites move around, they disperse, aggregate, recombine over time, 
On the one hand, this mobility can be deceptive and is rather fixed uh, geographically. When sites break off or are abandoned, they relocate in close, close proximity to an original settlement. Uh, there is also strong spatial correlation in the distribution of residential sites and shrines that consecrate natural and ancestral spirits. In fact, many abandoned homesteads were recycled into shrines, many of, the, many of which continue to be used today. Whatever the reasons for village mobility, uh, and we can imagine a few here, including internal dip disputes over land rights, uh, soil erosion, the drying up of wells and streams, political instability, we nevertheless see a continued material attachment to long-term principles of community making. The times of residence encased in the landscape speak to the effective pool of place, land, and spirit, each offering coordinates for the reproductions of social life. The obligation to land as a form of collective wealth, to place as a locus of memory, and to ancestors as safeguards against the unpredictable moods of weather, spirits, and events, offered certain sets of orientations, aspirations, and anxieties that open a horizon of preferred possibilities, ooh, while constraining other courses of action. They also speak to the capacity to manage risk and volatility and craft viable futures despite the violence of the trade. Another common assumption of Atlantic history is that rural folks in Seen but also elsewhere were largely shut off from international commerce. It is argued that goods originally from the coast circulated among the ruling class, which as a supplier of slave was Europe's primary partners in trade. Archaeological evidence offers once again a very different picture. What material inventories indicate is that increasing amounts of Atlantic goods found their way to all settlements, those of commoners and elites alike. While imported material culture is rare before the 1700s, by the 18th century, beads, tobacco pipes, metal objects, and especially <coughs> bottle glass form an increasingly large proportion of regional site assemblages. One finds fewer Atlantic objects in farmers' villages than in sites associated with aristocratic families, but they are undeniably there and in sizable amounts. In lieu of isolation, then, and on the background of political instability, what also seems to occur is a democratization of consumption, as goods once restricted to a small segment of the population became increasingly available to peasants. It is likely that farmers integrated coastal commercial circuits as suppliers of grain and cattle and received manufacturers in return. By 1750, what had been unfamiliar objects decades earlier are woven into the fabric of the familiar and became part of cultural tradition. Some products, like trade alcohol, gin in particular, were repurposed in the name of tradition and become instrumental in rites of sociality, like labor parties and ancestral worship. We find large amounts of broken gin bottles in 19th century shrines, for instance. Access to, co to coastal commerce also enabled peasants to access iron and weapons, the former being essential to the manufacture of agricultural tools and thus to cultivation, subsistence, and the reproduction of agrarian life, and the latter becoming increasingly handy for protection against rural exactions. Not one to romanticize consumption as an avenue of political freedom, but one effect of Atlantic consumption was to widen peasants' horizons of possibility. Uh, creating new tastes, entanglements, and expectations that bypass the channels of social orders. And I should also say, also say that it created all sorts of anxieties, and we find, for instance, responses on the part of, uh, or in the material assemblages of so-called elites uh, that suggest these level of anxieties, for instance, attempts to um, harness control over the circulation of certain objects uh, in order to sort of create various forms of distinction. Now, I had another section, so I will sort of go over uh, we'll actually jump uh, or sidestep that one, and I will just move directly to uh, my conclusion. Uh, my aim in this paper was not to deny that African lives are different today from 50 or to even 200 years ago, or that the conditions of neoliberalism have not dramatically altered aspirations on the continent. Nor am I suggesting that Africans have not, at different times, experienced ruptures, instability, and uncertainty, and that these did not configure the horizon of social economic possibility. <coughs> my point more modestly was that we have to be wary of narrative devices that posit from the outset a direction, structure, and mechanism to history, which they read backward into the past to make certain presents and futures look inevitable. Following people like Reutemann, Bakhtin, or Koselik, I prefer to track the many tempos of the short and long term that have constituted African encounters with the unknown, fashioning certain orientations to the future and narrowing others. Archaeology is, is a prime witness to the co-presence of past and the present since its archive preserves time's many strands in the medium of uh, materiality. While this archive is not immune to ideology, to meta-narratives, its attunement to multi-temporality does make it a valuable source of alternative histories. 
My intention here was to compose a narrative that addressed the assumption of collapse and immobility in Senegal's rural past, how local communities mediated certain un uncertain times and continue to make livable worlds. But I could have written an equally valid paper about how recent African experiences of crisis have antecedents in the colonial past, thus nuancing the novelty of the neo neoliberal moment. Or another account about the long-term continuities that have embraced since history, perhaps echoing Gonzalez Ruiba's point about the dangers of equating history with change and that continuity is a perfectly valid sort of form of historicity. Or a no less true story of poverty and dispossession, sweeping commoners and elites alike in the, over the past hundred years, a tale of capitalist violence experienced by poor people across the globe. The point being that Africa's history of engagement with the world is not one but many. Uh, and that tending to the temporalities encased in the archaeological record, amongst other sources, can help to rescue continental historicities from tone-deaf, preordained narratives. Combined with other sources, including African ones, can help to examine how past presents and past futures have shaped today's conditions and will continue to shape worlds yet to come, and thus to confront the demands and difficulties of thinking Africa otherwise. Thank you. so much, Francois. Our next speaker, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Syracuse University, Shannon Novak is a bioarchaeologist whose research interests include political and gender violence, historical memory, and the symbolic and political manipulation of dead bodies. These interests motivated her to study, uh, motivate, motivated her, uh, her studies of two infamous events in 19th century America, the Mountain Meadows Massacre and the Ordeal of the Donner Party. Her 2008 book on the former, House of Mourning, A Biocultural History of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, received the James Dietz Prize from the Society for Historical Archaeology. And her research on the latter led to the publication of a volume entitled An Archaeology of Desperation, exploring the Donner Party's Alder Creek Camp, co-edited with Kelly J. Dixon and Julie M. Shablitsky. More recently, she has completed a fascinating study of 250 burials from Spring Street Presbyterian Church in Lower Manhattan, uh, which will be the subject of her talk today, entitled Unpacking the Pews at Spring Street, Corporeal Congregations as and Asynchronous Lives. Please welcome Shannon Novak. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Uh, Matt, thank you for um, a very challenging task you put in front of me. Um, today, and, and for Francois setting this up nicely. Um, I'm, I'm going to take this down to a scale of bodies, talk a bit about methods for making time that we're involved in, in archaeology. So even though my focus will be on moving bodies and landscapes, some of the themes will undoubtedly be familiar to those of you working with shards and pots and other um, material records. Okay, so let's begin with a thought experiment. What if every form which had ever lived on this earth were suddenly to reappear? This intriguing thought experiment was proposed by Charles Darwin in his discussion of the mutual affinities of organic beings. Take the case of human evolution. <clears throat> if all the hominins that had ever lived were to reappear, we'd have something like this family portrait. Of course, this is not the way the world actually works because of the extinction of species. Extinction, extinction, Darwin argued, tends to separate groups of related organisms, defining and widening the intervals between the several groups of each class. Thus, it takes a thought experiment to imagine what the living world would be like without extinction. In approaching a cemetery, however, or any other aggregate of dead bodies, we're in the opposite situation. Now we're confronted with the sense that time and space is compressed. We tend to think of such aggregated bodies as a community, a set of individuals who coexisted in time and space and perhaps interacted with one another. And it takes a certain mental discipline to disentangle these individuals 
realizing that they were perhaps not acquainted with one another, that their lives may have been led over different generations and geographies. This paper is an exercise in such discipline, an attempt to overcome the temptations of conflation, the often unconscious collapsing of diverse histories and biographies that congregate in field sites, cemeteries, and laboratories. In bioarchaeology, such conflation takes at least two distinct forms. The first involves typological thinking, the collapse of empirical variation into abstract categories for analytical purposes. Especially problematic in this slide is the tendency to treat biological age cohorts as if they were a collective who move through age-appropriate time, space, and life experiences. For each individual, a terminus based on years, or months, or days, is calculated from a process of growth and decay. This process involves drawing on standards calibrated from past data and applied to specimens at hand. Yet it also involves looking forward in the sense that standards tend to shape our expectations and guide our research paths thus suggesting what form future data should take. Such models and techniques for making time are, therefore, as oriented to the future as they are to the past. The second kind of conflation is subtler. It springs not from the imposition of an artificial typology on the data, but from the seductive quality of density in the evidence is encountered. Specifically, the sense that a gathering of bodies implies social propinquity, as if a cemetery, for example, were a kind of community or village. Such an approach elides the array of social times and temporal properties that gather at, emerge from, or pass by these places. While time does not go unacknowledged or even intensively measured at these sites, um, excuse me, me measured at these sites, space-oriented tropes such as location continue to dominate our thinking. We emphasize going somewhere rather than some time. Both forms of conflation, typology and density, are based on what Whitehead long ago called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, the tendency to mistake the abstract for the actual. Alternatives to conflation are, to some extent, already available. To the typological treatment of age cohorts, for example, has been addressed by life course approaches that allow persons to emerge through embodied acts and interactions within shifting landscapes and social domains. Yet there remain, remains the challenge of positioning multiple courses in relation to one another, especially when people and things move in non-synchronous ways. Urbanizing landscapes are particularly challenging in this light as a result of their often frenetic tempos and rhythms of change. Such a context increases the importance of generational differences and the resulting non-contemporaneity of the contemporaneous, a concept also developed by Karl Monheim and Alfred Schutz and recently extended to the archaeology, to archaeology and the work of Gavin Lucas. Now, to escape the fallacies of synchrony and explore the temporal rhythms of city life, I turn to the case of the historic Spring Street Presbyterian Church in Manhattan. The church burial vaults, dating from the first half of the 19th century, were unexpectedly unearthed in 2006 and thus suddenly surfaced as a ready-made congregation. This is the footprint of uh, Trump Tower Soho, by the way. <coughs> Now, when their contents were unpacked, however, we see that this gathering is actually a catchment zone of mingled and mangled temporalities. The lives of some church members were quite brief and socially limited, while others had long, multifaceted biographies. Despite being placed together in death, they only occasionally cross paths in life. By following some of their traces to and from the site, were led to distant gatherings and serendipitous encounters along the way. Now, the Spring Street Church was founded during what's known as the dramatic transformation as the market revolution in Jacksonian America, periodization that requires unpacking in its own right. 
The emerging commercial economy altered not only the physical environment of New York City, but the social ecology as well. The ways people worked, raised families, formed communities, and engaged with public institutions. The church was one institution on the front lines of these changes. It was established and led by activist pastors who propagated an ideology of free will, self-improvement, and social justice, including an aggressive abolitionist stance. Now, constructed in 1810, the church building remained a fixture on Spring Street until it burned down in 1966. The burial vaults, by contrast, were only active from 1820 to 1850. And within these vaults were the commingled remains of over 200 individuals, ranging from several unborn fetuses to an 87-year-old man. Drawn to the church were the families of the emerging middle class, shopkeepers, craftsmen, clerks, salesmen, and the like. These are two individuals, the Hutchings, that were buried in the vaults. Um, also included in the congregation were a number of free individuals of African descent who were given full communion and whose children participated in the church's multiracial Sunday school. <coughs> so how then to make sense of these people buried in the church vaults without relegating them to statistical anonymity or creating characters of the zeitgeist? First, we have to let them move beyond the confines of the church. As Tim Ingold has emphasized, lives are not led inside places, but through, around, to, and from them, from and to places elsewhere. At Spring Street, stable isotope analysis has allowed us to identify one adolescent who was a recent immigrant. He was likely one of the many thousands of European travelers in the 1830s who flooded into the city looking for work. A coffin plate has allowed us to identify another person on the move, Nicholas Ware, a senator from Georgia. He seems to have had little to do with the church beyond a benevolent, a benevolent member of the congregation paying for his burial after Ware died suddenly while visiting the city. Though the bodies of the immigrant and the senator shared space in the church vaults, they had little in common and are unlikely to have crossed paths. Indeed, Ware was most likely dead even before the young immigrant set foot in the States. Now with this in mind, if we look closely at the demographic profile of the skeletal population, we have to wonder how many other mutual affinities have we created by categorizing people according to their cohorts? As in Darwin's thought experiment, have we simply bundled together beings who lived in quite different times and places? And if they were a congregation sitting in the pews together, would they even know the people around them? The senator and the immigrant would not have, though the young man might have heard of the gentleman from Georgia. Others might scan the pews searching for a glimmer of recognition. These points should give us pause because they raise an issue that is surprisingly difficult, both conceptually and analytically, the problem of generations. The idea of generation is a commonplace in American culture. The baby boomers, Generation X, the millennials, and whatever the next one will be called, these groupings are seen as having a commonality based on their year of birth and significant cultural events of their early lives. At the same time, good scholarly treatments of generational phenomena have been remarkably rare, especially when compared to the vast literature on other dimensions of social identity, including class, race, ethnicity, and gender. The one great attempt to theorize the concept was Karl Monheim's essay of 1923, The Problem of Generations. In his broader study of the sociology of knowledge, Monheim became interested in how being born in a particular time and place within a specific historical context had the potential to influence experiences over the life course. Monheim's rich essay sheds lights on biological and social relations, the nature of time, biography and history, and mechanisms of social change. While these points can't be elaborated here, I want to draw attention to two ideas central to his argument. First is the idea of fresh contact. 
the notion that interactions in one's formative years may be shared by a wider age group because their crucial first experiences put them in contact with the same events. The second is the non-contemporaneity of the contemporaneous, the fact that at any given time, older and younger age groups in a society may experience the same events, but the effects of these events will be different depending upon whether one confronts them point blank or against an already formed background. The observation that all people living at the same time do not necessarily share the same history has important implications for past bodies along with the worlds they shaped and were shaped by. So we want to reintroduce the gaps that Darwin emphasized, the absence and oblivion, oblivion that Olivier has argued provides the blank space that gives meaning. By attending to voids, beginnings and endings are unpacked, contingency proliferates, and new relationships become tangible. Now, Gavin Lucas has raised similar concerns regarding the problematic use of contemporaneity in archaeology, especially as it relates to synchronism and anachronism. His critique in archaeological dialogues proposes an alternative approach that draws on Alfred Schutz's concept of consociation. Schutz, a younger contemporary of Mannheim, developed a social phenomenology that highlights close contact, the sharing of physical as space as well as time. Consociates, accordingly, are individuals who actually meet, persons who encounter one another somewhere in the course of daily life. This is the way that Clifford Gertz puts it in his early essay, Person, Time, and Conduct in Bali. Thus, consociates, unlike mere contemporaries, are involved in one another's biography, at least minimally. They grow older together, at least momentarily. Lucas modifies the original concept of consociation in one radical way. He extends it to include both humans and non-humans. People can be associated with things, he writes, and even things can be consociated with things. This revision, Lucas argues, allows us to inquire about the temporality of things in relation to one another, not time per se. All right, so with these concepts in mind, we might begin to unpack the spring tree pews. Typically, we would approach our skeletal population as a series of age categories, each telling us something about growing up and out into the world at different stages before moving on to the next. Here, however, I turn this around and consider date of birth. Uh, and the wider social historical conditions during formative years of fresh contact. Now we're fortunate to have coffin plates to help us disaggregate some of these age categories, which appear to have forced some individuals into shared relations that may be dubious or misleading. In this chart, I've plotted the birth and death dates of 33 persons from their coffin plates. Males are in orange, females are in yellow. And what becomes obvious from this exercise is that the burial vaults, active for about 30 years, or approximately a generation, contain some people who lived and died over the span of a century. Moreover, when the age categories into which they were compressed are expanded, some people articulate with others at different times and stages of their lives, while others become distant memories and still others futures imagined. If we layer in key events, some of them, we, uh, those changes of note that altered the landscape and wider historical structures, Monheim's generation problem and Schutz's consociation become more apparent in our case. Those maturing in the mid-18th century witnessed the birth of the Republic and the contentious process of institution building that those born after the turn of the century would only encounter as history. At the same time, other notable changes would mark their formative years. The War of 1812, an end to slavery in New York State, and the 1834 race riots all made people aware of their positions and their relations to others within particular places and times. So let's take, for example, two indiv indiv individuals recovered from the church vaults. Rudolphus Bogert, 
and Louisa Hunter, whose lifespans now appear in blue. Bogart was born into a large, well-established Dutch family, some of whom were slave owners. His formative years were spent on an occupied island. Manhattan was the only major urban area to remain under British control during the Revolution, and in turn suffered more physical damage than any other American city. <coughs> At the same time, the city's population grew dramatically from 17,000 to 30,000 residents. Now the common, which you can see, mm, you see on the far top right, near the pond, which is the edge of the city. Um, so the, the um, I lost my place here. Uh, the common, or the northern margin of the city, if you look closely, you can see that it, hold, it held an, a poorhouse, and it abutted the Negro's burial ground, the long bar that you see between the pond and the common. That's going to be an important place for us. The Negro's burial ground is now known as the African burial ground, and it had been active since 1700. In 1809, long after the British had departed, Louisa Hunter was born. The city in which she grew up was a bustling mercantile hub of more than 90,000 residents, at least three times in size the previous generation. The island's landscape had been leveled once again, but this time by city planners. Obstacles of nature were removed to impose a gridded street system that, according to city commissioners, combined beauty, order, and convenience. Meanwhile, on the plot of land that contained the old Negro's burial ground, a city hall was constructed. The adjacent poorhouse was rebuilt and renamed the New York Institution. In Louisa Hunter's childhood, the facility was overflowing with destitute women, immigrants, and free black families. This was the place to which she would move at the age of 12, when her father began serving as the assistant superintendent of the institution. Only five years later, after she died from a long and painful illness, a chronic condition evidenced by the growth disruptions and scars in her bones and teeth. By that year, 1825, Rudolphus Bogert was a succe ugh, successful 59-year-old merchant with a family of his <coughs> own. His body, by this time, had begun to show the wear and tear of years of hard physical labor. Fused vertebra, arthritic joints, broken kneecaps, and pulled muscles were just some of the conditions that would worsen over the next decades before he succumbed to an ulcerated bladder. Whether Bogart knew Louisa's father or Louisa herself is unclear. When she died, however, he may well have joined the funeral procession, which departed from the New York Institution, wound its way past the now unacknowledged graves of 18th century slaves, and arrived almost one mile to the north at the Spring Street Church. By now, we're in a position to appreciate the, the different generational worlds that existed within the same physical space occupied by these two bodies. Consider the different ways in which Bogart and Hunter would have related to the Spring Street Church itself. Bogart would have understood it as a relatively new institution, founded in 1810 when he was 44 years old. Hunter, on the other hand, was an infant when the church was established and would never have known a time when it did not exist. For Bogart, being a member of the church would, be, would have been a matter of choice, perhaps a deliberate decision to congregate with people of different ethnic, racial, and class backgrounds and to associate with a radical abolitionist stance. Hunter, by contrast, was born into the congregation, presumably as a result of a choice <coughs> made by her parents. The Negro's burial ground was another place that would have been familiar to both Bogart and Hunter, yet with quite different textures and meanings for both. Enslaved Africans were part of the social landscape in which Bogart had grown up. His ancestors had likely owned slaves, and the process of emancipation in the state of New York had only begun in 1799 when he was 33. Again, Hunter would have had a very different experience of both African Americans and the local land where so many of them had been buried in the 18th century. In fact, from the age of 12, Hunter had lived either right on or next to the former burial ground. 
which had been closed and slated for development before the turn of the century, well before she was born. Finally, in a more general sense, we might ask, with whom should Bogert be associated in our minds? With a young woman whose body shares the burial vaults? Or with his seemingly distinct neighbors in what is now called the African burial ground? In a surprising way, Bogert may have shared a common location and set of, ex of historical experiences <coughs> with many people whose bodies were buried on the margins of white society. And yet the idea that Bogart or any of the Spring Street congregants, 19th century Presbyterians, should be associated with 18th century slaves is unlikely to occur to us unless, that is, we take seriously the generational dimensions of these people's lives. Now at the same time, such an approach raises new questions and concerns. Was it possible for people of such different social positions to share in important events of fresh contact as they grew older together, at least for a while, and looked back upon their lives? Would they have paused to think of one another? Moreover, would they have even recognized each other as consociates or even the same kind of person or thing? Having moved with Bogart and Hunter through Manhattan's shifting chronoscapes, we cannot help but wonder whose futures or hopes for the future were realized and at what cost to others. As the political and ethical dimensions of making and growing in a city become tangible, our illusion of synchronicity shatters once again into heterogeneous tempos and asynchronous lives. It's my great pleasure to um, introduce the last speaker of the morning before lunch, uh, my friend and colleague Andy Roddick, uh, fellow Andeanist, who is assistant professor of anthropology at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, Andy is an archaeologist whose research is based in the south central region, uh, islands of Bolivia, and has employed ceramic analysis to investigate community organization in the formative period before the rise of Tiwanaku urbanism. He's engaged in a range of current projects, one of which has made use of ceramic photography, archaeometry, and geological survey to make sense of communities, pra communities of practice in late formative and Tiwanaku times. This research has been published in part in his recent volume, Knowledge in Motion, Constellations of Learning Across Time and Place, co-edited with Ann Stahl and just out at the University of Arizona Press. Uh, in addition uh, to a new exploratory work on late formative landscapes in the eastern Titicaca Basin, he is now working on a project that will be the subject of his talk today, a collaborative archaeology of the present that explores the social context of learning, embodied techniques, and crafting traditions of modern potters in the Titicaca Basin. The talk is entitled Changing Practice and Sedimenting Futures, Reflections from Lake Titicaca, Bolivia. Please welcome Andy Roddick. Uh, thanks very much. And I, I want to echo um, what we keep hearing today, which is both a, a great thank you uh, to the organizers and also the great um, what the what the fuck uh, to Matt, um, but actually I should follow up on that because I I feel like my talk today um, builds on a lot of what we've been hearing today, um, but it's also allowed me, as you'll see, to really reflect on what I've been up to, um, and I, I want to sort of preface this with I feel like a bit of an outsider uh, in the group today um, because as you'll see in my talk, a lot of the stuff we've been hearing about this morning is a bit of a new a new world for me. Um, and it's allowing me to kind of push forward with th rethinking this, this current project uh, in important ways. 
Okay, um, in the fall of 2013, I spent several weeks exploring the Altiplano, or high plains around Lake Titicaca. I planned to build on my earlier doctoral work, which focused on the social life of pottery prior to the emergence of the Tiwanaku state. In my doctoral work, I explored archaeological traces of learned practices in pottery production, seeking to identify potting communities of practice at three 2,000-year-old sites. I had returned to Bolivia to explore the embodiment and social relations of technical practice with active craft producers in the region. I was also following up on some advice I had received as a, as a very eager graduate student. Uh, Mickey Dietler from the University of Chicago told me that all, arch all archaeologists should do some ethnography uh, early in their careers. Jean Lave suggested that I slow down and pay attention to clues hinting that I might be asking the wrong questions. And I'm going to return to that at the end of my talk today. Now, the community I will discuss here first came to my attention through conversations with Tiwanaku, Tiwanaku potters, who for the past few years have helped me in my compositional work on raw materials. These potters told me that the highest quality raw materials in the southern Titicaca Basin are found in a village cluster near the, community of, uh, uh, near the city of Batayas, and the best cooking vessels, or ollas, are produced in and around the community of Chihipata Alta. Now, Many archaeologists have traveled through this area blind to the fact that the rising smoke represents almost daily pottery firings, including myself. Now, I've spent hour, hours and hours studying fragmented potsherds and working to conceive of potters in the past, and my first visit to Chihipata sparked my archaeological imagination. I saw potters deploying subtle gestures I've been tracing through detailed attribute analyses, and pit firings that left burn patterns I'd seen in my archaeological work. My discussions at the clay and temper quarries suggested uh, a complex taskscape that emerged from generations of practice. It looked like an ideal place to explore craft learning in the present and to challenge my thinking in the deeper past. I returned to Canada and applied to the Werner Grand Foundation uh, for, a, for a grant. I tentatively framed this project as ethnoarchaeology, but stressed it would not serve as a direct analog to past practice but rather as a socially and historically contextual window into situated learning. Now, several months later, my project was denied funding due to a suggestion that my, quote, ethnoarchaeology was inappropriately structured to explore the middle range. And you can see here that the, the main reviewer really took me to task on this, and some of you might be able to guess who this reviewer might have been. Now, I, I eventually was awarded the grant after extracting the problematic term uh, and, and sort of conducting some other theoretical tweaks. Now, I've spent the last few seasons working in Chihipata, becoming more familiar with the potters, the vessels, and potters' landscapes, but also the complexities of the regional history. These findings are having an immense impact on the way I'm framing this project. So today, as I said, I want to reflect on this work. Um, I'll touch on why ethnoarchaeology cannot encapsulate our ongoing work, and I'll also grapple with the complexities of time uh, and my own archaeological practice, as suggested by, by, by Matt, before a final word uh, uh, on, on possible futures. The small rural hamlet of Chihipata Alta relies on subsistence farming, collective work, and direct engagement with capital systems of exchange. Pottery production and livestock has long been the primary economic practice of the community. The approximately 29 families of potters still active in the community create several fairly standardized forms using many of the same tools and techniques of their grandparents. They also vi visit a pr uh, prominent quarry where they extract what's known as geo, a siltstone used for tempering the more freely available clays found in, in and around the community. Now, an average potter produces approximately 1,500 pots per year um, at 19 pots per week for approximately 40 weeks. If, however, one takes into consideration the tempo of increased production during seasonal annual fairs, the output is staggering. We have now followed the completed pots from the community to kin-based uh, barter exchange, daily artisan markets in La Paz, weekly fairs around Chihipata, and larger annual ceramic fairs around the larger region. We have interviewed buyers who traveled hundreds of kilometers to purchase these rather humble cooking pots. While new economic possibilities are eroding this long-lasting tradition, discourses of health, which I'll, I'm happy to talk about later, along with regular scarcity of gas in these rural villages are keeping this indigenous economy alive. Up until quite recently, it was primarily women who learned to produce pottery in Chihipata Alta. But today, men and women are equally active in all stages of potting. 
This recent change in gendered practice is likely due to political economic shifts across the landscape, but in particular to the substantial influx of NGO funds. One organization focused efforts on transforming Chihipata potters into producers for the tourist art market. This group financed a sophisticated production space in the community, which was equipped with kick wheels and electric furnaces. Both clay experts from the university and potters from outside communities were brought in to teach Chihipata altar po uh, potters new techniques and how to glaze vessels. This effort resulted in several years of success, with men becoming particularly involved and competitive in the productive uh, process. And one particularly skilled artisan sold his wares to buyers in Europe and North America. Today, however, no potters work here. This top-down imposed locality is a ruin, the expensive glass, shelving, and wheels broken and scattered about the workshop. Although potters complain about the need for a warm space for communal potting, few consider this failed architecture appropriate for their ongoing practice. In fact, one of my favorite quotes for this when I ask people, I had several people say, somos olleros, no somos renacistas. So we, are, we make cooking pots, we are not artisans. Um, so the identity concept of learning here is, is of great interest to me. Now, its strange political resonance in the village might be explained by the traces of alienated relations of capitalist production within a longer genealogy of pot potting practice. The women potters of Chihipata Alta felt no relationship to this new form of practice, which required new tools, clays, and most importantly, new relationships. In contrast, the temporary flow of economic capital resulted in new social and cultural capital, and men became interested, uh, in turn, in the craft of potting. Now, how long women have been producing in this community is a bit unclear. We have good evidence that potting in the Batayas region extends back at least to 1864, when the Hacienda system exploded across Bolivia. Although within the Hacienda system, a significant part of indigenous people's production, either in kind or money, was given to the landowner, the Hacendado had less control over more informal indigenous economies, such as pottery production. In fact, I, I've interviewed some 90-year-old uh, people who grew up on these haciendas with just incredible stories uh, of, of what this was like. Now, in 1952, a, a revolution spread across Bolivia, and an associated agra agrarian reform brought about a wide number of social reforms and started a process of division and fragmentation of the land around Batayas with plots obtained from the agrarian reform subsequently divided up between communities and individual members, creating what are often called ex-hacienda communities, or new communities. And the present-day uh, community of Chihipata Alta is an example of such a new community. Now, community elders recall the social landscape of potters and the economics of production, and el elders have recounted stories of the daily practices of pottery in the 1930s and 40s. We are also exploring the history of Chihipata in, in the historical archives, but also the traces of ceramic production, both curated and discarded around Chihipata and neighboring communities. For instance, many potters have kept heirloom vessels passed down across several generations, which we've begun to analyze. Ceramic remains have also been found embedded uh, in the adobe walls of ruined, abandoned homes. In fact, um, I'm starting to become kind of a, a known character in the region for taking pictures of, of pots and walls. Um, now, as the style of adobe brick manufacturers changed over the last century, we can relatively date these sherds. And preliminary petrography has found that most of these sherds have the same siltstone temper from the local quarry peppered throughout the clay matrix. Now, similar sherds are eroding out of ash mounds scattered across town which perhaps have the best evidence for the history of potting practice. Researchers working elsewhere in the Andes have found similar features, what appeared to be small hills that are, in fact, archaeological features. These mounds of ash developed from many repeated dung firings, and ceramic remains accumulated over many years, and continue to serve as the basis for ceramic firings. Many potters have found that there are advantages to allowing these, these mounds to grow, and they provide some height to the firing area, allowing potters firing the vessels Take, it, take advantage of predominant afternoon winds that, grow, that blow across Chihipata Alta. Now, at this point, we've come across mounds that are well over four meters in height. In fact, remarkably, you can see these on Google Earth, several of which are, that are associated with abandoned houses, and others have memories of mounds as large as houses. We've yet to excavate these mounds, but plan to investigate the changing fuels, tempers, and other ceramic attributes and also hope to use OSL dating to explore the age of both the ceramics and the ash deposits. Now, there are fewer potters active in Chihipata Alta today than even 20 years ago, 
Dairying activity is less work and is supported by a variety of governmental and non-governmental agencies. Such interventions are slowing and in some cases stopping the growth of these features. These mounds, however, are not simply residues of the past, but are a nexus of the past and present. Um, what our keynote speaker would call a memory object in which particularly particular times are inscribed. For instance, as one of the more predominant milk producers in town spoke of the history of potting in the village and specifically of his parents' and grandparents' skill, he physically oriented himself to the large mound on his, in his patio. Now, we are also finding these mounds scattered across the region in communities that no longer produce pottery. Thus, we have evidence of, a pot, of potting dynamics from the recent past, residues of multiple generations of practice on this multi-temporal landscape. Even as new economic possibilities are introduced to the region, many are maintaining these memory objects as key elements of, greater, of their greater social landscape. Now, this might be a good point to briefly discuss uh, the changes with my own framing of the project. Many of the findings discussed this, uh, thus far would not fit within a conventional ethnoarchaeology. To echo my grant reviewer, they would not build a sturdy middle range bridge. Now, Ethnoarchaeology, of course, has had a rough few decades, as many as you know, with scholars demonstrating how it can inadvertently flatten time, overly simplify objects, and misrepresent living communities um, through an anti-modernist nostalgia, something we've heard a little bit about today. Indeed, in the world of Lowenthal, nostalgia is the universal catchword for looking back. Others stress the ethics of treating modern peoples as analogs and the ahistorical functionalist and universalistic position of the subdiscipline. Gonzalez Rubal stresses that ethnoarchaeology is an asymmetrical science, quote, founded on an absolute distinction between past and present, nature and culture, moderns and pre-moderns, things and people. Here, as he puts it, ethnoarchaeology creates the other twice over. An other in the present is a means to envision an other in the past. Paul Lane stresses that even the most recent past differs from the present. The practices like those we, we see in Chihipata Alta, uh, which I initially assumed had great antiquity, may in fact be the product of much more recent processes. Lane suggests it is much more productive to ask how different societies ascribe historical value and meaning to the material traces of the past, such as the ash mounds and quarrying pits uh, I've discussed so far. Now, ethnoarchaeology, of course, brings significant processual baggage, and a number of scholars have suggested potential reframings. For instance, Susan Kuss survives, uh, suggests the most exciting ethnoarchaeology has moved away from the often narrow focus on solving archaeological problems, instead working towards the creation of a terrain of theoretical dialogue between subdisciplines and projects focusing on material culture. She calls it an approach an archaeologically informed ethnography. Now, I worry that such an ethnographic focus often results in the subsuming of archaeology into an ethnographic framework. Indeed, some of the most enticing seeds of a new archaeological approach have often transformed into something much more aligned with ethnography. And I think Gonzalez Rubal provides an important way forward with his reframing of ethnoarchaeology as an archaeology of the present. And of course, this is building much on, on Laurent's work. So in, the wor in, in his words, um, this archaeology works with living communities, studies collectives composed of humans, animals, and things, investigates the textures of daily life and assesses the complex nature of time as enmeshed in things and landscape. By carrying out this kind of research, we can still contribute to archaeology and anthropology as a whole by encouraging a more reflexive, symmetrical, and materially conscious practice. Now, in other words, the past and the present are connected in both more nuanced and complex ways, whereby the old bridging trick of the middle range, again, the kind that I was chastised for, becomes rather nonsensical. Gonzalez Rubal suggests that this kind of archaeology can provide comparison across time, but from an ethical point of view, and avoids turning people into those mere archaeological analogs. Now, there's no question that my work in Chihipata Alta is informing my work in the deeper past, as Mickey Dietler promised it would. But how to think through potting practice on very similar landscapes, in fact, virtually the same uh, landscapes, and yet in distinct socio-historical settings? The considerable temporal distance of these communities, a temporal gap that encompasses the rise and fall of several political and economic systems, disjunctures between the colonial and republican era, and recent socioeconomic changes in the rural countryside. These, cases also, these case studies also vary in resolution. 
Work on my 2,000-year-old pottery provides a fragmentary view of the full range of practices associated with these communities of potters, but offers a deep time depth. Work with Chihipata potters provides a detailed perspective into the range of practice, practices and, crucially, discourses surrounding rural Bolivian craft production, but currently in relation to a very short period of time. Temporal separation, historical disjunctures, and a lack of clear units of comparison make a direct historical approach or ethnographic analogy problematic. Now, here's where the concept of juxtaposition, a term advocated by multi-sided ethnographers such as Marcus, Paul, and Neri, offers some productive space. While such an approach is still a form of analogical reasoning, uniformitarian principles are not employed. <coughs> and there is no need to generalize away the differences between experience near and experience distance, between modern and pre-Columbian potting communities. Juxtaposition helps us to explore the power dimensions of communities of practice using different analytical approaches and highlights sites where links between individual activities and structural forces are most visible. Juxtaposition can, like the most carefully structured and nuanced analogy, encourage a careful appraisal of dissimilarities as well as similarities. And now, due to time restraints, I'll just shamelessly plug uh, the book that, uh, that Parker <laughs> kindly um, uh, called me out on here. Now, let me do what others have done today and finally turn to this issue of historicities, or futuries, sorry. That was some kind of Freudian slip, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> we might begin by exploring Andean ontologies of time. For the Bolivian Aymara, the past, or Naira, conceived as in front of. But this term is also used for the present. There is a single tense for both. Only the term for the future, kipa, is separate, a term that also means behind or unseen. This term, kipa, is appropriate for thinking about the future of Bolivia. The future here is unseen and uncertain in many ways, but also one of hope, where indigenous people have, for the first time, some control over how it is represented. Indeed, a powerful if symbolic attempt at decolonization in Bolivia involves a more indigenous framing of time. Several years ago, a new clock was installed in the Plaza Murillo in La Paz, the location of the presidential palace. While this clock looks like any other clock on first glance, it in fact works backwards. The president of Bolivia's Congress told the Associated Press that this modif modification is, quote, a clear expression of decolonization of the people. But the changes afoot go far, far beyond such symbolic measures. The government has enacted structural changes in response to decades of neoliberal policy, changes which might radically transform both the nation state, and isn't transforming the nation state, in fact, and the material practices in Chihipata Alta. For instance, processes of decentralization across Bolivia has given local communities and municipalities much more control over heritage management. In fact, many archaeologists working in the region are unclear how to properly attain permits. This is a great stress for me at this very moment. And there is great uncertainty as to the role of archaeology in the new Bolivian nation state. Similarly, elders in Chihipata Alta are unclear about the futures uh, of their, their pot making tradition in the face of rapidly changing economics. There's been threats of a new massive agrarian reform that might impact access to their clay quarry. But there have also been a number of changes in education policy initiated by Bolivian President Evo Morales and enacted locally by community teachers, uh, which may help sustain such crafting practices in rural communities. Now, I'm, that sounds encouraging, although the teachers have approached me to teach the ceramics, which is just astonishing uh, in many ways. Um, so I'm interested to see how the next generation uh, of potters place cr uh, crafting traditions into their futures. Now, Paul Wayne suggests that ethnoarchaeologists might shift their primary role from interpreters to something more like enablers. Indeed, as my focus has shifted, my work is increasingly more aligned with an applied archaeology with a variety of new stakeholders and possible futures. I have no false expectations here, and we've had our share of difficulties, tensions from within the community as to what my role should be and I'm happy to discuss this later. But as we distributed pamphlets of our ongoing work, municipal leaders have approached us, asking to produce texts on other communities' traditions. The founder of the NGO that built the workshop has asked if we might collaborate on a future project. Of course, I'm rather uh, reluctant, given the ahistorical and decontextualized thinking behind the earlier project. Nevertheless, such collaboration would bring it with considerable level of funding to the community. We also plan to hire lawyers to work with the community to form a union and to help establish their practices as intangible heritage. Finally, the community has also asked for financial support to rent a backhoe to dig out the clay quarry. 
The, clay, the quarrying of clay is the most onerous step in the operational sequence, and such a move would substantially prop up the future viability of this crafting tradition. I would be playing the role of enabler in the future sedimentation of regional ash mounds. Now, these potential futures, not to mention the complex dynamics of the last century, highlight the naivete and, yeah, even the nostalgia behind my initial entry into this community. So I'm following Jean Lave's advice and trying to slow down. Am I asking the right questions? What might a more politically guided and historically aware research agenda look like in this context? Certainly something resembling an ethnoarchaeological project has now morphed into something much more complex, involving work in the historical archives, excavation of recent and historic mounds, and explorations into the social history of the quarry site. Much like the seemingly simple gestural practices behind these quotidian pots, these landscapes are multi-temporal and complex and require a careful rethinking about how presence, pasts, and futures meet. Thank you very much.